Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I am Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. And Neil, I am super excited today because the whole Daily Crew is actually going to a Yankees game. Field trip. I know. A little bonding moment. Uh, they're playing the Phillies, though, so half our crew is like Philly fans. Yeah. More than half. Yeah. Me, Emily, Bryce, are all, we're all around from Philly. Yeah. I'm not actually from Philly, but I have roots in Philly. We wear Eagles, Sixers, uh, Philly stuff all the time to the office, but the Phillies are just abominable right now, starting 0-4. Terrible. I so it's your first time to Yankee Stadium, which will be interesting. It's nothing particularly special, yeah. but, you know, it's, it's, it's the, somewhat iconic. The whole crew is going... I don't know if hair and makeup are going to make it, but we'll see. We'll see. I'm excited. I haven't actually met hair and makeup, yeah. but <laughs> they might come tonight with a surprise appearance uh, in the sixth inning. Uh, I will look out for them. have no idea what they look like, but I'm sure they'll introduce themselves. Uh, let's get to our show. We're talking about astronauts and Dogecoin going to the moon. E-scooters are in retreat in Paris, and Toby will give his weekly lecture on Gen Z trends to us millennials, which I'm always excited a about. A lecture? A lecture? I was thinking of what word to say, and it is kind of a lecture. Okay. It's not bad. I'll take it. Professor it, That means it's informative, and I'm going to listen. Okay. And maybe fall asleep. <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, let's start out, though, with this really under-the-radar story that we wanted to share with people. Former President Donald Trump is set to appear in Lower Manhattan Court today. He'll become the first president to be arraigned over criminal charges in history. So we're not going to go too in-depth right now uh, because we're going to wait till we know what the specific charges are filed against him. Uh, and we'll discuss that tomorrow. But here's a quick rundown of what his itinerary is going to look today. Uh, in the early afternoon, he'll take a motorcade with a Secret Service detail down from Trump Tower in Midtown to the courthouse. He'll be booked just like any other criminal defendant in New York with fingerprints and a mugshot. He'll appear before a judge for about just 15 minutes who will read him his charges and ask him how he pleads. He's he expected to plead not guilty. The whole process is expected to take just a few hours, and then he's going to get back on Trump Force One <laughs> and then go back home to Florida and give a speech in prime time. I, I think that's so funny is that his lawyer is basically like, yes, a lot of uh, criminal defendants don't necessarily give a speech. Like They're advised to stay quiet, but that is just not how Trump does He's it. running for president. I know. He's <laughs> literally giving a campaign speech later. It must be so stressful being a lawyer. Like Your client just goes and makes a speech. At SBFs. Right. No, exactly. He was writing Substacks. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many angles we can take on this, and I'm sure that we're going to keep talking about this. But obviously, one of them is just the media attention and just kind of the symbiotic relationship between Trump and the media. I actually found this quote from The Art of the Deal, which is the book he wrote. Did back. you read it? I, I've never I've never read it. I've seen it in bookstores. But from The Art of the Deal, from a bottom line business perspective, bad publicity is sometimes better than no publicity at all. So I feel like Trump is really taking that to heart uh, during this trial. Absolutely. There was a report in Rolling Stone yesterday that he could have had this arraignment happen over Zoom. In a, in a very chill thing, he wouldn't have been photographed, he wouldn't have been have this circus, but he said, no, sure. I want to pl play the victim here and go to New York and have this, ha I know that cameras will follow me everywhere, that protesters and supporters will all descend on uh, Lower Manhattan, so he knows, he knows what, what he's doing. doing. Yeah, and if we, <laughs> if we want to apply a monetary value to what he's doing, so far, they've raised, his campaign has raised seven million dollars, like, pretty much solely off this event, so... It, it pays, yeah. Right pays. now, right now in the monitor, I just want to point out we're playing CNN coverage of Trump Force One taking off from Florida. And so they had cameras. Yesterday was the biggest circus on cable news. I didn't watch any, but I saw it online. And they, CNN had a literal speedboat in the harbor as Trump's plane was flying into LaGuardia. Ridiculous. They, they love it. It's their, it's their Super Bowl. Um, but Neil, I know since Trump is going to have his mugshot taken, and you prepared some of like the most famous mug shots. Yeah, well, I was looking them up. Uh, some more serious ones were lots of civil rights leaders back in the 60s got arrested. So you had very famous ones of Rosa Parks during the Montgomery bus boycott and John Lewis looking really young. He posted on his Twitter. Actually, he's like, look at me. I'm, I'm looking funny. pretty good. When OJ was arrested in 1994, there was a lot of controversy because time ran the mugshot on its cover. But they made his skin darker, blurred his face. 
um, and gave him like an unshaven look. And Newsweek also publishes Mugshot at the same time, and they didn't touch him up. So Time had to apologize and got into this big controversy. Have you seen Bieber's Mugshot from his DUI in 2014? That was when he was in his peak, like arrogant. He's looking. Like, he's doing like a blue steel thing, like yeah. he's an Aeropostale yeah. uh, photo shoot. And then I didn't know this one until this morning, but Bill Gates was arrested yeah. uh, for blowing a stop sign in New Mexico <laughs> in his early 20s, and he's just grinning I know. his face off. He's arrogant. My question for you is: Okay, you get a mugshot. Maybe you've already had one, and I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot I don't know about you. Are you smile? Like, what's your face? What's your pose? I think I'd go. Well, it depends on what it was. Like what I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's like a huge. If I'm blowing a stop sign, then yeah, I'm probably giving a wry grin. But anything else, I, I'm keeping blue steel. I was thinking about that. It is a new era. You know, it sets it's the so tone for you going forward. Yeah. And if you want to change your brand then you should go for it with your mugshot. Like right now, I'm, I'm still a, a nice guy kind of vibe. <laughs> and I think if I get arrested in my mugshot, I'm going full scowl okay. and changing the, the public perception of me in, into a badass going forward. There you go. I like it. Um, all right, that's the Trump arraignment. We're obviously going to be talking about this in the, in the days and weeks to come. Um, but let's go to a story that's a little more fun, honestly, like a little bit more out of this world. Oh. <laughs> I know, it's bad. <laughs> Yesterday, NASA announced the four astronauts that would be heading to the moon on the Artemis II mission. And they are, I'm going to list their names off, Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, Christina Koch, and Jeremy Hansen. So I'm just, that crew is notable in, in a few ways. Uh, it's the first woman, Koch, the first person of color, Glover, and the first Canadian, Hansen, to ever go on a lunar mission. That's great because we all know who to blame when something goes wrong. We got a Canadian. <laughs> Canadian, yeah. I think that's so funny that they, it is though. It's So far, it's been mostly Americans and uh, at least when it comes to NASA and uh, Trudeau was like, this is great. We're having a Canadian up there. So he's very proud of that. Um, if everything goes to plan, it will take off in November. The mission itself is not actually one that's going to put boots on the moon. It's just going to do kind of like a close drive-by of the moon. Um, and then, yeah, this it's it's a big deal, though, because this is Artemis 2. Artemis 3 is the one that will actually put uh, people walking on the moon. So, yeah, this is the, the, the Artemis crew. missions. Yeah, it's the crew. We have the crew. What do you um, – they must be so excited or nervous. I don't know. That it's. I wish it was happening sooner. Yeah. Because these guys just have to kind of wait and hang out and train for the next, you know, 18 months, is it? November of 2024. November 2024. So, do so I don't know. I, I would just get butterflies for the next yeah, you know, it's scary. year and a half for them. I love these – the photo shoots that come out of these. They're honestly, like, so epic. They're – it's – awesome epic lighting they're all arranged like in a almost like a boy band like pose and they almost look ai at this point because like they're so perfectly lighted and stuff like that my brain's just broken by ai let's talk a little bit about how this mission is going to work so like the various components to the mission because getting to the moon is a little complicated and a lot of companies and different you know components go into it so we have orion which is the capsule where the astronauts will be traveling on that's where they're just going to hang out Space launch system is the powerful rocket that will get them to the moon. Mm -hmm. And you were giving me some some space some launch system facts. It costs eight hundred million per launch. So it's not that that's everything from like building the rocket to the fuel to doing the launch itself. So it's not something you want to mess up really. It's also taller than the Statue of Liberty, and it's the most powerful launcher ever. It's fifteen percent more powerful than the Saturn rockets that launched the original lunar mission. So this thing is a behemoth. And then finally, to get from uh, Orion to the moon, we're, go we're leaning on SpaceX. I know. It. We're leaning on SpaceX here. We got Starship, which is that massive rocket that you see uh, g doing tests in the middle of nowhere, Texas. Mm -hmm. um, that's what they're going to use to uh, get them on the moon and back onto the capsule. And that is not ready yet. Musk has said they're trying to do an orbital mission this month. So we'll see. Yeah. That thing is, <laughs> I love looking at that, honestly. Yeah. It looks very cool. All right, moving on to Paris is burning. <laughs> well, Paris is rejecting e-scooters, actually. Uh, on Sunday, Paris became the first major Euro European city to ban e-scooters, uh, those divisive little micro-mobility uh, devices. This is a really significant move, actually, because Paris was one of the first cities to adopt shared e-scooters during their heyday back in 2018. So it's seen as quite a U-turn. 
And the vote was more lopsided than the UConn game last night. <laughs> there was 89% of people who voted voted for a ban. The only thing is no one voted on this. Fewer than 7.5% of eligible voters came out. And the young people who were more in support of keeping the scooters on the streets, uh, they stayed home. So are you pro or anti-scooter? I'm pro scooter because it's just such a convenient way to get around. Like I have been there where you're, especially in like a, a city that you're not, it's not your own city. It's so nice because you don't know the transit system that well. Like you don't really want to take an Uber. It's great to just have a scooter. So I'm, I'm pro it. I'm, but the problem is there's idiots. Like there's dumb people. Yeah. I also think there's a tragedy of commons issue where parking these things, they're not yours. So they're like, for the common good and people just leave them everywhere. They leave them in the middle of the streets. They don't take care of them. It became trendy to like throw them into water. Yeah. So it just became this thing where it's kind of the worst of humanity showed through. Um, so I can see why there's this groundswell of support against them. This probably isn't good for content, but I agree with you. I'm so, <laughs> we're supposed to disagree yeah. with each other, but I'm also a big fan of scooters. I think the reason that they're in retreat right now and they've gotten so bad is that it's a, it's a governmental failure because there isn't infrastructure for scooters. So how, so if I'm on a scooter in Los Angeles, like I have been, I have to go on the sidewalk and you know blast through pedestrians right. because there's not a, a scooter lane for me. Yeah. So they don't have the infrastructure for scooters. And so people are inevitably going to do stupid stuff because they don't have lanes. They don't have traffic lights that are devoted to them. It's like putting cars on the road without having stop lines or lanes or anything that's basically what what's happening yeah so um i i see that there's you know a lot of uh consternation around li like vandalism and then also pair you know three deaths were caused by scooters and over 400 injuries but my thought is i looked at the the stats for cars 66 pedestrian deaths were related to cars in 2016 so i you know we're well, not really focusing on the problem here. difference of scales though too a lot more people are driving cars than pedestrians but yeah you're right i mean it stinks, honestly. Like, but I totally. I was there in Paris while people are ripping around. It is drunk, yeah. Like kids, basically. And right. I could. I was even doing my old man shaking fist yeah. with the cloud, and I'm like, "Slow down, get away from me." So I could see it. One one sec. I just don't want to talk about bird. <laughs> bird is this the, the corpse of bird? The yeah. corpse of bird. So these companies are retreating the the e-scooter companies were booming why i want to bring up bird real quick is because it was the fastest unicorn ever within one year it became a billion dollar company of its founding and now it's worth less than a cent it's crazy the per share yeah per share crazy <laughs> Cra yes. yeah less than one cent eventually so yeah. so the scooter market has utterly collapsed it has collapsed okay neil so yesterday we were scrolling twitter and kind of simultaneously everyone in the morning brew slack channel just said are you seeing what I'm seeing right now? Like, do you see this? And what we were re referencing was this little doge icon in the top left corner of the web browser of Twitter. Basically, Elon yesterday replaced the Twitter logo with the doge meme uh, only on desktop. And everyone was like, am I hallucinating? It was like, is there a little dog there? Honestly, I'm just going to give a quick, for the less internet obsessed, Doge is a Shiba Inu. It's a meme that has kind of been popular in culture. If you don't know what Doge is at this point, good for you. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy for you. You're, you're, you're smarter uh, from it. But part of the reason why he did this is one, he did send a tweet like back in 2020 saying like, Hey, I'm going to buy Twitter and like change the logo to a Doge. So he's kind of like referencing his own, his own joke from back in 2020. But also there's this other aspect to it is that he is currently being sued for $238 billion in damages for allegedly driving the price up of Dogecoin via tweets, via memes, and then letting it crash. And so there's this huge like class action lawsuit against him that is just ridiculous on every level. Yeah. So Dogecoin obviously spiked on this news in in you know developments that we're still seeing like memes and stuff can drive the market. We yeah. were kind of wondering whether that would stay. So it was up, you know, thirty five percent yesterday before I don't know what it's up. It, it today. went right back right down. back down, yeah. but it's still forty three up forty three percent up year to date. 
the craziest thing is that it's still among the top 10 most valuable cryptocurrencies right even, even after having collapsed more than 90 percent from its peak so i have no idea about the merits of this lawsuit i i can't expect that it's going anywhere it, it accuses him of you know pumping the price of running a pyramid scheme of going on snl knowing that he was going to yeah. tank it after selling dogecoin yeah it just remind it just brought me back to 2021 and those that feels like a lifetime ago i know and I mean, I guess credit to Musk for like falling through and like actually going for it. But just I, again, this story, it makes you feel <laughs> like almost dumber on every level when you go through the reactions in the reactions, to the reactions. Yeah, just a lot of a lot of dumb jokes. There, there's not the first time Musk has bit, gotten legal trouble with his tweets, though. Remember, there there was a recent lawsuit about taking uh, Tesla private, private yeah. that he was sued for. That was actual. That was seemed as very legitimate because mm -hmm. he investors lost a lot of money and he misled them because, or he allegedly misled them because he didn't actually have the funding to take Tesla private when he said it. But he won that lawsuit. He was found not liable last. Uh, I think it was in February, actually. So that was seen as kind of a surprise victory for Musk, and he's done pretty well in the courts over so far. <laughs> over all of this yeah. legal drama. And it does look like this lawsuit doesn't have a ton of legs to it. Um, and yeah, the the lawyer's basically saying like he can tweet pictures about a cryptocurrency. Yeah. So we'll we'll keep an eye on that. I hope we don't speak of it <laughs> again, though. Honestly. Okay, Neil, you mentioned it at the top of the show, but let's go to everyone's favorite Tuesday segment that's also an alliteration. That is Toby's Trends. Okay. Um, so today we are talking about love and dating in the post-AI, post-lockdown world. So up first, I want to bring you to China, where the newest craze is women paying cosplayers to dress up as their favorite male video game characters than going on dates with them. Now, obviously, this is an extreme form of infatuation, of fandom, but it honestly makes sense if you start thinking about some of the social factors that go into this. One, there's a huge gender imbalance in China still, just like socially, culturally, the leftovers from the one-child policy. So there's a lot more men than there are women. Mm -hmm. And then two, the pandemic happened where a lot of like the youth in China were isolated, didn't have these normal relationships that you typically do during this age. So they turned to the digital world. And now that the world's opened up, they're trying to like bring that digital infatuation into the physical realm. So it's a crazy story. It feels very Black Mirror-y, but... You, when you hear the social factors, it makes a little yeah. bit of sense, right? Yeah. What What is the end game? Are they just going on one date, or if they have, you know, they hit it off? Are we? It's are honestly, we they, they <laughs> feel very fulfilled by the dates. They, if the cosplayers, which ironically are often women, dress up as ah. these male characters, but people leave the dates saying like we had a great time, like they they yeah. played the character that I remember from the video game, so. It's kind of harmless. Obviously, it's not great for... I think it's awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, it's not great for procreate, like, right. you know, like continuing the human race. Yeah. But I think it's I think it's creative. Yeah. You can see how all the trends like led to yeah. it. Okay. And then the second part of this, I mentioned AI. So literally people <laughs> are dating AI versions of their exes. So there was this Reddit post that went pretty viral of a girl who used OpenAI's sandbox feature, which you can actually create and train your own chatbot. She fed the, the AI chatbot text from her ex and now can communicate with an AI chatbot version of her ex-boyfriend. Ver that this one's a little. I'm no ther I'm no therapist. I I'm gonna hold off on saying it's so that's healthy because the Reddit post is, she specifically calls out like I'm stable. Like I have I work yeah. with a therapist. I'm literally just using this to instead of texting my ex. Yeah. I'm emotionally maturing and moving on from this relationship. So she was kind of self aware about it, but holy moly, I it's a it's a dangerous slippery slope yeah. where people are gonna start dating these like alter egos of their of their former yeah. lovers yeah. whenever i hear about particular trends that are happening in ai i always have to think to myself we first you know kind of started using this in november yeah and so uh it's moving fast yeah i have not yet recreated my ex on uh <laughs> on a uh, chat bot very, very but hey i'm bored on sunday <laughs> all right fun. final story toby would you watch a harry potter tv series about the original books <laughs> I am firmly in the yes category in this, but talk me through it. All right. Well, either way, you're gonna you're probably gonna get one. Yeah. Uh, HBO is close to a deal with Warner Brothers to turn the seven Harry Potter books 
original ones into a TV series, one season per book. The idea is there's a lot of appetite for the original story, but the movies had to skip over many parts and couldn't really marinate in the Potter world because of the two-hour runtime. Mm -hmm. Again, this is obviously going to be very divisive because J.K. Rowling has alienated much of her fan base with her stance on trans rights. And so we see this conversation every time a creative property of Harry Potter comes up. We just saw it with Harry Potter or Hogwarts Legacy, mm-hmm. which was the video game adaptation that just sold like gangbusters. Though. Yeah, 850 well, million in global sales. Crazy. Two weeks. Like bigger than any of the movies. So it, it's hard to kind of, uh, we hear about the fan base turning against her, but then Harry Potter clearly still resonates with this generation, with previous generations in that new Harry Potter media just rips. Plus, I think that the original movies, while impactful, people aren't so tied to them and would be fine seeing other Harry Potters or other Hermiones played by other people uh, would be perfectly fine with that and would be totally engrossed with that and wouldn't be like, we wish we had Daniel Radcliffe back in there. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, don't know. I don't, honestly, that's I've, my thought. Yeah, maybe. Like, it would be weird to see a different Harry Potter, though. I, I think after the first episode, you'd be yeah, totally, you know, right. engrossed. And there probably are some interesting stories to be mined that the movies had to uh, the gloss over. Yeah. I mean, that was the main thing about the movies. They're like, why didn't you, right. you know, talk about what happened on page 37? To, yeah, you have to leave stuff out. So I, I would be excited for it. Yeah. Also, you have to just trust HBO is going to yeah, make this right. awesome. They've had Euphoria, White Lotus, Succession, Last of Us, all bangers. Um, and they're also dipping back into the well. There's going to be another Game of Thrones prequel. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and they're making Warner Brothers, the parent, is making more Lord of the Rings movies. Eh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? We're dipping back into the well. That is our show. Uh, make sure to email us at morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com about everything, anything we talked about. Uh, as always, we couldn't do this without our incredible team. Show's producer and editor is Emily Milliron. Show's technical director is Justin Orlando. Our queen of graphics is Michaela Heck. Welcome, Michaela. Our supervising producer is Bryce Belloff. Dan Bauza is our master of sound. Hair and makeup put on an invisibility cloak and hasn't been seen for days. Devin Emery is our chief content officer, and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow. <laughs>